Yes, a little high, if you would. That was too much for me. A little bit better? Higher. Louder. Louder. Too loud. Louder. <coughs> what? Perfection and everything. All right. Thanks for letting me talk to you this morning. I'm talking about, what am I talking about? Games, probably. Games for fun and games for learning is my catchy as I can be title. Uh, I'm going to talk about three things and then we can talk about whatever we want. The three things that I want to talk about are uh, first teaching and learning, uh, then functional gamification, then we'll cut off the functional gamification and just talk about fun. Uh, and then any discussion, questions, uh, some of you gave me questions earlier, so we can talk about those and see where it goes from there. And learning, we're, we're all involved in this in some way in libraries. Uh, and we, I think, look at concepts of gamification and competition as things that we don't, we don't really do in libraries. Uh, competition because it's not, it, it goes against the cooperative nature, the sharing nature of libraries and resources. And gamification, just because it's a, a big, weird word that doesn't. It's intimidating and it doesn't sound like something that we really want to do a whole lot of. But we're already using gamification in education. It's been part of education since our modern education system was built, uh, just not in the same ways that people talk about it now. Uh, anybody who's ever gotten a grade in a class, that's gamification. It's pretty shoddy, but it's there. Anybody who's gotten points for completing homework, that's gamification. You're keeping score. You're keeping track of what you've done. You're collecting achievements. Uh, your college transcript is just a, a listing of your achievements and your performance. Uh, all those grades, letters, numbers, that's gamification. Not in a great way, but that's what we're talking about. Applying game elements to things that are already happening in your life. The trick, though, is making it fun. So my, my comment about gamification is just this. Don't worry about gamifying things. Use good games to teach good things, and look for the game elements that already exist. Maybe points, scores, competition, or challenge as motivational tools. You've heard some of those themes in earlier presentations. Find out what motivates people. Maybe it is a challenge. Maybe it's an opportunity to teach someone. Once you've found the fun in something, then it stops being a chore. It stops being work. It starts being fun. It might as well just be a game. It doesn't mean it's not serious. It doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile. But look for those opportunities. If you've got a lot of uh, subject learning opportunities and skill opportunities in games. It's not just, let's sit down and have some fun. Got a lot of math, got a lot of geography. You've got history, you've got economics. All of this stuff baked into the themes, into the mechanics of your games. They can be a great way to open doors to concepts, themes, and skills. Strategic thought, planning, Resource management, logic, critical thinking, any of these skills that you would use in the workplace that you would apply to being a librarian, to being a director, to being a participant in something like this, project management. We could sit down for a two hour seminar in project management and all I would bring is a game. You could talk about hand-eye coordination, working with kids, that's the, the one thing that video game publishers say across the board. Video games are worthwhile. We're doing something good for kids. We're teaching hand eye coordination. Okay, great. That's your counter argument to uh, talking about violence or other content that might be sensitive for, for young people to engage with. Well, hand eye coordination. Great. Pull out something like pitch 
car, and you've got anti-coordination, you've got group involvement, you've got teamwork, and you've got geometry of, can I drive my car bouncing down the sides of the track, or should I make a straight shot? Teamwork, communication, all kinds of stuff. These soft skills and the thought patterns that are so beneficial to whatever job you might find yourself in, or your patrons, users, or customers might explore. How to be a winner, how to be a good loser. A lot of people don't get the second one very well. Games for mathematics. You'll see this in a middle school classroom. I have a, a buddy who's a middle school teacher over in Derry Township. He's got flashcards. He's got pattern matching games. They'll do high digit memorization contests. It's gamification of arithmetic, of algebra, of geometry. But you can do that with other games that are uh, maybe better disguised in their mathematics. Property management, anything like Monopoly or the farming game where you have to plan ahead and think, should I invest or should I hold my money? That's mathematics, that's economics. You've got your you've got your door, you've made it fun. It's not a chore, it's not homework. It's something that's engaging. Something like Freedom, the Underground Railroad. This is the uh, game in the middle of the table here. Also designed by a library worker, Brian Meyer, uh, up in New York State. Does a lot of work with board games, with games in general, in schools, school libraries. Uh, Genesee Valley School Library System, I believe, is the organization that he works for. Uh, designed this board game. It's a cooperative, cooperative game. All of the players play together against the mechanisms of the game. So you're learning teamwork, you're learning cooperation, you're learning planning and strategy, critical thought, but you're also learning geography, history. Uh, and if you want to tie it into some of the societal issues that make headlines today, talking about race relations and balances of ethnicities between different regions, as you work to get your slaves out of the plantations and to freedom in Canada. Or something like Power Grid. If you're a Monopoly fan, I apologize, I'm not uh, <laughs> at all. And something like Power Grid lets you compete, auction, buy, sell, trade, plan networks, look at different uh, different economic systems and the values of different resources. <coughs> uh, this game, players take on the role of uh, electric utility companies. They want to buy different power plants, fuel them with different resources, so perhaps it's easy to invest in coal early on but as the game progresses, coal is less efficient and less common. It becomes more expensive. And maybe you can't keep up with somebody who's decided to go nuclear. Learn some geography with this also. Where is Boise? What's it close to? And why does it cost so much to go across the Rocky Mountains? Maybe you should just stick down in the, the congested Eastern Seaboard, where it doesn't cost as much to run from city to city, but it gets jammed up really fast. Think about things in a little bit of a deeper way. You can engage through experience, say, all right, why does it work this way? Why is it expensive to go from San Francisco to Cheyenne, You're crossing two mountain ranges in a desert, not even illustrated on the board? but it's baked into the design of the game. Plus, if you're a shrewd auction bidder, you can totally screw your friend out of that garbage burning power plant that totally needed. 
something like suburbia. Town planning, planning ahead, looking at the different concepts and, uh, and ideas that impact your town. I have this game uh, on the university iPad available to play, $5, $10, uh, and it'll let you have the full experience of this game. Fantastic. Why doesn't anybody want to live next to the superhighway? Why doesn't anybody want to work next to the dump? <laughs> if you fill your town with heavy industry, you might make a lot of money, but your reputation is going to go down. People will move away. This game is designed so that every decision you make, every lot that you purchase, is going to impact not just the things that are around it and your overall score, but how the rest of the nation views your town. Your reputation will go up or down accordingly, and your income in keeping with that. Fantastic game. Easy to play, easy to pick up. Do a little bit of math on my scorekeeping too. And then pitch car, which I mentioned. Physical ability. I've played this game with children as young as two and children as old as 92. I think the box says six to 106. <laughs> Pretty close. Uh, this this game has nearly universal appeal in my experience. Clicking race cars around a track, you have to plan ahead, you have to think, but you can just sit down and play. I've seen a group of college students scream, shout, jump up and down. When they sat down to play the game, that was the only time they sat. They were standing up, moving around, angling for the best shots, trying to figure out if they can finish the lap first and win the race. Extremely simple, but a valuable experience, tying people together, and maybe accidentally learning a little bit too. Lots and lots and lots of subject and skill learning opportunities. Functional gamification, this is the stuff that people are usually talking about when you hear the term gamification. Talking about, well, how can we add badges to our online class? How can we award skills or achievements to the kids who come in for our summer reading program? Maybe we could use an alternate or augmented reality game to engage our community, our user population. Badges are fine as far as they go. They'll let you add a game element on top of something that you're already doing. But it's not tied in closely or integrated with the activity itself. Uh, so you could take it or leave it. If you find that it's something that your users want, if it's something that would be beneficial to your community, then run with it. Uh, there are resources out there that will uh, that talk about how to do badging, how to create badges for your users. But think about it before you jump right in. We talked about, uh, we talked about weekends, I think in the, at our June session, using devices, using something that's not, not a game piece, there are no game rules associated with it. But if you walk into a space and it pings, pings your mobile phone, says, here are some books you might be interested in. You turn your physical space into also a data space and a play space. Now you can engage people in a different way, in an interesting way, maybe an unexpected way, <coughs> to say, get involved, check something out. Just like a game has rules and objectives, you can introduce new objectives. Now, if somebody comes in, well, I just want to look at yesterday's newspaper. I just want to look at the latest James Patterson novel. Whatever your users are looking for, perhaps you can introduce a new motivation while you're here. 
I notice you browse in the science fiction section. Why don't you come to our book discussion group? Trigger that with a beacon. You transform your physical space into a game space. ARGs, augmented reality games, or augmented reality games, uh, they're possible through, through mobile phones. So uh, using GPS technology, using QR codes or barcodes or other uh, scanning technology, you can introduce uh, a layer of information over something in the real world. You can use social media to connect with that also and really string out a longer campaign. <coughs> We already see themed summer reading programs. Uh, was superheroes this year? Mm -hmm. What is it next year? Health and wellness. Health and wellness. Right. Uh, we, <laughs> uh, one of our, our back burner projects here was to use an ARG to gamify our entire first year experience program. From before students move on to campus, starting to introduce a storyline that will take them through their freshman year of college, engage in different activities and events using the new objectives of the augmented reality game, uh, the ARIS platform, A-R-I-S, for, uh, for smartphones is a good way to start working on ARGs if that's something that you're interested in. But again, it's a, it can be a mammoth project, so start small. Within our organizations, you can use gamification to work with team building or individual roles or trust between coworkers and team members. Role play gets kind of an odd rap in a lot of circles. Uh, I'm guessing that if you think about role playing games, you're thinking either something very dark or something very strange. But it's common practice in psychology and helping professions to practice, to talk through a situation. How does a mental health counselor at a school handle a student who is suicidal? You don't wait until it's a life or death situation. You sit down and you practice. One person pretends, the other person reacts as if they were the professional in that, in that scenario. play out the difficult situations. You could use this with serious, serious training situations. Active shooter drills. That's a game, not a fun game, but it's a game. You're practicing a skill. You're introducing a pretend scenario so that you know what to do if there is an actual crisis situation. Penny, yesterday, yesterday was talking about the training games that she plays with her staff. This is the same idea. Not necessarily to reference desk bingo, uh, but can you walk a phone patron through your website without looking at the computer? That's practice. That's building trust in each other. That's developing skills. She moves into the next point, skill acquisition, training, and practice just been talking about this. <coughs> Practicing scenarios, you've got your gamification. Anytime you're not reacting to the true real life situation, but practicing through strategic planning, thinking through what you need to do and when, that's gamification. You can write a paper about that if you want to. I don't. <laughs> Pandemic is an example of a game that I've used, uh, I've used here in class to teach some of those soft skills, teamwork, cooperation, collaboration. This is another cooperative game. Players play against the game. The players act as members of the CDC with different roles and different skills facing a global outbreak of disease. As the diseases spread across the globe, players have to figure out how to develop cures by sharing information, by research. But they also have to keep the epidemic in check. Too many outbreaks, too many infections, the world is lost. It's gone beyond what anyone can control. 
we played this in uh, a class of 24 students on four teams. So they had to communicate within their team as individual players. What, what do we want to do? And then between teams, say what do we as a team need to do? It highlighted frustration, communication difficulties, when they need to ask questions. These were uh, first semester, sophomore year students. Things that come fairly naturally to those of us who have been in a professional workplace for quite some time. If you don't know how to do something, perhaps you should ask or look for an answer. These students would take an action to find out what would happen and then were surprised when Lisbon gets overrun with the blue plague. <coughs> Something like this can be a fantastic object lesson for your staff, for your users, for students, lots of different applications. And then the fun. I presume that we all have dreams of doing fantastic, engaging programs for our users. One of the options that, that I've explored and really leveraged to great effect is ALA's uh, International Games Day at your library. This is coming up in about three weeks, uh, November 21st, I think. Uh, you can get uh, promotional support from ALA. To, flyers, brochures, posters. You can get donated game materials from game publishers. Uh, I've used this to, uh, to leapfrog my game purchasing budget to do more with less. There are uh, online games, electronic games, and uh, tabletop games available, and activities for all of them. There's an international Minecraft Hunger Games event. Uh, there, last year there was a Super Smash Brothers worldwide tournament that was hosted through International Games Day. Fantastic way to engage your population, do something fun, do something interesting, use reflection, use your space, and use the resources that uh, hundreds of libraries around the world are already putting effort into. You can do themed events. Uh, I was talking with someone earlier about doing an an Asian theme, Japanese culture event using the game Tokaido. Bring out your stir fry, your sushi, your chopsticks, put on your kimonos, play Tokaido, and then do an evening anime festival. Engage your users, find the things that they're interested in. There are games on many, many, many different topics, and it's a way to get people turning their eyes away from the screen and interacting with each other in a way that brings out discussions, and improves or creates relationships between your users. <coughs> you can also use games to explore innovation. Like we heard in the, the Makerspace presentation, give people a way not just to use, but to tinker, explore, and create. Tabletop games are much more accessible for this kind of work than electronic games. You can't crack open a PlayStation you can't crack open a PlayStation game and change the parts. It's on the disc or it's on the software already. You can't change how Call of Duty works. You can't change how Smash Brothers works or Madden 2015 if you want to put historic players in the game. Tabletop games, you can pull cards in and out of the game. You can create a custom board. You can 3D print extra pieces. What would Monopoly look like if you had two little construction cranes and it took several turns for your hotels to be built and you couldn't collect any of them until they were in. You can explore innovation, give students, give your users a way to engage with materials, explore different concepts, remix your stuff, take the zombies out of City of Horror and put them in Ticket to Ride. Now you've got zombie trains. Sounds awful. Use it with small businesses or entrepreneurship workshops to explore critical thinking, 
matter of thought. Engage special interest groups. Perhaps you've got a, a group of senior citizens that you really want to bring into the library for more than just large print books. Get a Scrabble set. Move them up into some of the more heated competition of something like Power Grid. It's not hard to learn. There are gateway options available. Create a community that wants to show up week after week after week to connect with each other and to connect with your organization. Maybe just use your space as a tournament space. Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh! Lots of products have a competitive aspect to them. The X-Wing Miniatures game sold out their world championship in less than half an hour. People who want to fly to Minnesota so they can drive little spaceships around on a table and shoot at each other. If you have people in your community who play these games, give them a space to get together. If you want to get people into your, into your building, it might not be a bad way to do it. We had yesterday, I was sorry to miss it, we got our game design students here at Harrisburg University doing public play testing of their board game designs that they're doing for their game design course this fall. That playtest could have been in the library. It was last year. It wasn't this year. So why not use your entrepreneurship club or your Lego robotics group or whoever you have in your library who's interested in making games? Give them a space for playtesting. Advertise it. Get people in. Get some publicity for your users. Turn them into those adjunct staff, people you don't have to pay who want to teach other people and share their passions. The how of this can be a little bit tricky. I do my game collection here at the university for about $300 a year. Last year, I had close to $1,700 worth of games come into the library on a $300 expenditure. Some of that were don some of those were donations that I solicited from the publishers. Writing emails, going to the contact me page. Hard work and isn't glamorous, but a lot of publishers are happy to get their materials out to libraries because they support what we do. And they like to see people sharing their games and being enthusiastic about them. I've arranged a, a discount with our local game store just a couple miles up the road here in Harrisburg, so that anything that I buy there for the university, we get a 25% discount. A lot of the time it won't compete with Amazon, but I get the benefit of the expertise and the conversation with the people there. I get to support a local business and build a partnership within the community. They are, they're now, uh, the de facto bookstore for our game design students. They'll go there to buy their dice, their play mats, for the things that they have to make in their class. Because we've established that relationship over time, they gain customers. Talk to designers, talk to publishers, go to the small conventions in your area. Lancaster hosts the World Board Game Championships. It's coming up pretty soon here. It hasn't happened already. This is something I didn't even know existed a couple years ago. But people fly in from all over the world to compete in strategy games 45 minutes away. Great place to go and talk to publishers, players, find out what's interesting, find out what's coming, and ask for freebies. This could be a table at your library. Five people gathered around, engaging with each other, engaging with friends, developing skills, having a great time. Doesn't take a whole lot of work on your part. All right. I have some questions that people give me already. 
through Steam, I purchase online, or I purchase from my local game store. Uh, Harrisburg, the Harrisburg area is big enough to have a couple board game shops dedicated to hobby, hobby games. Uh, but you can find things at Target, you can find things at Barnes & Noble, uh, and Amazon and the other online shops are as accessible as they've always been. If you're not sure if you have a game store in your area, look for the competitive players, your Magic the Gathering players, your Pokemon <laughs> players, and ask them if there's anything around. They will know. some resources up on the screen in a minute. Uh, the key English language res resource, you can find a lot of stuff in German, if you read German. <laughs> Headquarters of Global Board Gaming. BoardGameGeek.com is the place to start. Has a listing of as many board games as they can track, something like 12,000 different games. Uh, has ratings, reviews, Resources. Some of the games that I have, I have I've printed off little cheat sheets because the rule books are 30 pages long and it's easier to just go through a one page sheet. Uh, board Game Geek is a fabulous resource across the board for board games. Shut Up and Sit Down and the Dice Tower Network are both uh, good general outlets for game reviews, uh, but there are many, many, many more. You can find podcasts, you can find videos, you can find text reviews, a lot of it is just presented online by, by fans and players. If you're looking for something with a, a little bit more authority, you can look at the Spiel des Jahres Prize, which is uh, issued in Germany every year, for the best board game that Germany has seen this year. Uh, I don't always agree with their choices, uh, sometimes they for a certain audience that doesn't fit what I'm looking for. So, as with any collection development question, you have to consider your own use, your own users. <coughs> if you're looking for something with broad family appeal, for people who are comfortable with board games, the Steel of Yaris is a great way to go. Uh, there are several other awards, nothing quite as authoritative as the Academy Awards for things like the New Barrier You can also look for my Twitter review screen, but that's okay. That was fun. And I had a couple questions about cataloging games. How do I catalog games? I put a barcode on the front and I create a catalog record. I have to do original cataloging in maybe two thirds of the cases, unless it's something very strange. I, I stamp the 
the board. If there's a board, I stamp the rule book and the box and possibly some other key components. I don't stamp every card. Uh, and some pieces are impossible <coughs> to mark little wooden cubes and houses and things. Uh, I figure if they get lost, I can go downstairs and pretty print more if I have to, or buy a baggie of little wooden blocks, if that's what it takes. I do keep listings of all of the pieces in the game. Most games have the, have the contents listed either on the box or in the rule book. Uh, the cataloging record has a space for that as well. So I just type everything out and we're good to go. Just like, and I'm guessing some of you may do this, I don't think that every library checks every page of a book when it comes back in. You might flip through it. Okay, most of the book is here. It looks in decent condition. I don't check every component of a game when it comes in. If you're going to pay $50 for a book or $50 for a game, and you're going to replace the book when it gets doused in coffee and chewed up by a dog, or somebody smokes on the book, uh, then why, why would you give more concern to a game? Your time is valuable. You need to spend that on true priorities. If you do check every page of a book, though, you'll want to check every piece in your game. And some good resources for cataloging games. Uh, I usually just call Gabby, but she has uh, pointed me toward a site which I don't remember if I put up on the slide or not, so I'll put it on the board if I didn't. There are a couple resources out there. Some additional resources, Board Game Geek, Dice Guy Network, Shut Up and Sit Down, all of those for reviews, ratings, and other resources. <coughs> BecausePlayMatters.com uh, is Scott Nicholson's site. He works with games up in New York State. He had been uh, on the library faculty at Syracuse, I believe, uh, library science faculty. I, I'm not sure if he's still there, but he's very involved in the, uh, the academic side of researching board games and their application in libraries and learning. And there's my contact information, which you may already have. <coughs> Do you have other questions, comments, thoughts, ideas? <coughs> things play through, teach, teach the game quickly, something like Pandemic would be a fantastic one because then you've also got the cooperation and communication aspects. Say, all right, we're going to take an hour or an hour and a half, we're going to play through this game, and we're going to find through this game some of our weaknesses as a team, as a project group. Say, all right, here are the things that we need to practice, here are the things that we're good at, because encouragement of your team is a key element of that training also. Here are the things that we're good at, that you would sell at. Here are the people who are the natural communicators. Here are the people who are the natural strategists. Now we can specialize. We can find good ways to leverage those skills and enhance our performance as a group. That would be the approach that I would take. <coughs> David, is there a field when you're cataloging uh, where the type of skill is listed that that game develops? Not that I know of. There are, uh, there are occasionally subject fields that emphasize different 
thematic aspects. So Freedom Underground Railroad has a subject area of slavery and American Civil War, but it, uh, and I think there's a descriptor in there that it's a cooperative game, but I don't think there's anything in there that says planning, strategic management, communication, um, because many of those are, are fuzzy terms and you can apply them like saying a video game develops hand-eye coordination. You could put that on anything that you touch and look at. The, the, it can sometimes be so broad as to be useless uh, or so fuzzy as to be unidentifiable. Uh, and I'm not a cataloger, so I can't speak with a lot of authority. turned out to be pretty good. And uh, I backed the, the pack of games, the tiny uh, pack of gum size games. That was a Kickstarter project as well. So sometimes you can get a good discount, but uh, you have to be, or I would want to be, <coughs> fairly confident in the quality before diving into something. big obstacles for people engaging with games is you play the same eight games for the last 50 years. So these are the ones that you had in the basement or in the coat closet growing up. If you like Risk, try Pandemic. Monopoly, maybe Power Grid. Trivial Pursuit, Wits and Wagers might be a good option for you. Candyland, I don't know what you should do. Try to figure out. Mastermind, try Love Letter. It'll play faster and be a little less 70s. If you're a fan of Clue, try Mysterium. It's Clue, but with psychics. Poker, bluff someone with Skull and Roses. If you like the take that element of sorry, Throw in some zombies and do it in an apocalyptic city, in city of horror. If you're a chess fan, chess is chess. But if you're looking for something a little bit different, try Hive. Play chess without a board. And if you like the dexterity games, like Jenga, try something like Pitch Card. Try something a little bit different. And the resources, which I showed you before, and let me put up that cataloging site because I didn't add it to my slide.
David, could you read that? It's hard to see. I can. It is schoollibresources.wix.com slash cataloging board games. And I have to give credit to Gabby for finding that and sending it to me. So I would stop bothering her. Can you do it again? Oh, wait. Now, I understand that I'm probably standing between you and lunch, so if you have other questions, uh, let me know separately, and we'll let everybody else keep. Thank you very much for your kind attention.